Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. Welcome to the worship service this morning at the Smyrna Church of Christ. We're glad that everybody can be here. Those of you in the building, those in our fellowship room, downstairs, those who are outside, those who are live streaming with us, welcome this morning. Thank you for worshiping with us. We'll start with number 449. Number 449 in preparation for the Lord's Supper. 449. Man of sorrows, what a name for the sun. about to partake of the Lord's Supper, let our minds go back to the cross and the sacrifice that our Lord and Savior has done for us. Let's give thanks over the burden. Holy Father in heaven, we thank you for this bread that represents your son's body as he has hung on the cross. Let those who partake in it and do it in a manner well pleasing to thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. give thanks over the fruit of the vine. Holy Father in heaven, we thank you for this fruit of the vine that represents your son's blood shed on the cross for our sins. Let those who take it do in a manner well pleasing to thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Number 238B, number 238B, after this song we'll have scripture reading and prayer. Alleluia.
This morning is taken from Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Galatians 6, 1 through 10. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so feel, fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. <clears throat> let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this day and its many blessings. We thank Thee for the opportunity, the privilege that we have to come here this morning to worship Thee and, and learn more of Thy Word. We pray that everything that we do today will be according to thy word and that we will worship thee in spirit and in truth. We ask thee to be with the ones that are sick, the ones of this congregation and others. We ask thee to be with them, restore them to the health once again, if it be thy will. We also like to ask thee to be with the ones that's lost loved ones. Be with them and may they look to thee and thy word for their comfort. We ask thee to be with us as we continue in our worship. Forgive us when we sin. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to mark in your songbooks, the invitation song this morning will be number 675. Number 675. After having that marked, if you will, turn to number 148. Number 148 will be the song for the lesson this morning. If you'd like to, please stand as we sing. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah from the heavens, praise his name, praise Jehovah. And his glory is exalted, and his glory.
glory is exalted and his glory is exalted and his glory trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all ye people, princes, graders, judges. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Please be seated. What a thrill it is to be together. What a joy it is to open the book of God. And what a pleasure it is to be a Christian. Having obeyed the gospel plan of salvation through faith in Jesus as the Son of God, Jesus said, except you believe that I am, you will die in your sins, John 8, 24. Having repented of sin, changed our mind about living in sin on purpose, which God commands of all men everywhere, Acts 17.30. Confessing, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, as did the eunuch and other Christians, Acts 8 and 37. And being baptized into Christ unto the sending away, that word remission, in Acts 2 and 38, of our sins. Being raised to walk a new lifestyle, Romans 6 and 4. And walking that to the very best of our ability faithfully. Revelation 2 and verse 10. We look forward to the home prepared by the Christ. John 14, 1 to 3. Which he promised to his disciples and to us in principle. And throughout the Bible we have the promise of eternal life. If we live faithfully the Christian life. We're engaged in a study of what is the Christian life. I've tried to approach this from the standpoint of a puzzle, putting a puzzle together with various pieces. And we've noticed a number of them as they interconnect, putting together the picture of what it is to live the Christian life. What does it mean to be a Christian? Peter wrote a whole book about that. One man wrote a sermon book and entitled it from 1 Peter, God's Definition of a Christian. You really, if you think about it, have God's definition of a Christian beginning in Acts 2 and continuing through Revelation 22. That's what Christianity is all about. It's not a series of formulas to which we comply. It's a lifestyle. It's what we are. It's what we become. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's why you're described as a new man in Colossians 3, 5 through 17. And you walk a new lifestyle, Romans 6 and verse 4. It's newness. I like that word in Romans 6, 4, newness of life. People are enamored with new things. 
I've been tickled for a number of years now that you can go to a store, you can buy a little container of things, and it's called New Car Smell, and you can spray it in your old stinking car, and it's supposed to make it smell like a new car, so you're riding down the road thinking, see the psychological effect, I have a new car. It may still sputter and stammer and cough and spit, but it smells good. But you can't do that with Christianity. You cannot spray some outward spray on a Christian and say, okay, you smell like a Christian. Christianity is what we are on the inside. And it is seen on the outside. So when we deny ourselves, self-denial necessary to follow the Christ, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself. That may very well be the hardest part of obeying the gospel and living Christianity. Denying me. Wanting to do what I want to do. Paul got the picture. In fact, I believe Paul is the greatest example of self-denial of whom we read in the New Testament outside of the Christ. In Galatians 2 and 20, he said, I've been crucified with Christ. Now, that's self-denial. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. It's no longer Paul. The emphasis died on Paul. But Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, now that's that Christian life, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. I can get lost in John 3.16, so love the world, seven or more billion people. But I can't get lost in Galatians 2.20. He loved me and gave himself for me. So I deny self, step out of self, and stepping into Christ in gospel obedience, and then living in him as we live, enjoying the spiritual blessings in him, Ephesians 1 and 3. And being the example we need to be, because we absolutely trust him. So today I want to put that picture piece into place call Christian influence. Because I've denied self and I absolutely trust him, I exert an influence. I may not be aware of all the influence I exert, but I exert influence. Sometimes people think they're insignificant. And no one sees me. I am not important. But you underestimate yourself if you think in that term. You influence people. You influence people whom you do not know you are influencing. And that is a challenge to all of us to be what we ought to be all the time. And that is a challenge, isn't it? Because the devil, through the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the vainglory of life, 1 John 2, 15 to 17, is trying to get me to fall away. He used Judaism in the first century church, as Paul would enunciate in Galatians 5, 4. You who would be justified by the law, you're falling away from grace, literally falling out of grace. And that's what Satan wants. And yet we're encouraged to be diligent, to live faithfully for God every day, and thus, wherever I am, I'm exerting Christian Influence, And you never know that unless people tell you, and often they don't. Back when things were normal, whatever normal was, and we did basically what we wanted and went wherever we wanted, and we didn't think about thinking about a virus somewhere, there are times, and most of you know that I enjoy eating, I see I have company today. I enjoy eating, and we enjoy eating out. I like to let them clean up. Don't you ladies like that? Try to give Nancy that every now and then. So we would eat out, and sometimes you get a bad server. I've told you about that little sign, the invisible sign on my forehead that's seen only to bad servers. And when I walk in, the, the light illuminates to them, and it says, there he is, sick him. And they do. And they introduce themselves. I'm so-and-so, and I want to be, or I will be serving you, or I'll take care of you. They don't mean a word of it, but it sounds good. 
And so I order, and you know the first words out of my mouth. If you've ever eaten with me, I drink a lot. Bring me two to start with. And with these who are reading the sign, that's it. The two are delivered, and that's it. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I can react in a whole lot of ways. And waitresses and waiters have told me they dread the Sunday crowd, the people who go to church, as they say it. They said they're the most rude, impatient, discourteous people we have all week long. My teeth dropped when a waitress told me that one day. But it helped me. I'm glad she told me because it's helped my psyche to think, okay, now I don't have to be ugly about this. And after my meal, I'm going to leave a little card that says, come worship with us. And the way I react to the light going off and this person reading the light and reacting to it is, might determine whether they ever walk in the front door of a church house somewhere to learn the truth. And just because people let me down, I don't have to be ugly. That's helped me. I wish I could tell you it's never happened. I wish I could go back and erase the times it did. But when I'm conscious of my influence, I'm aware of the fact people are watching. Just because the person sitting at the traffic light, which is now green, really likes to admire green lights and take a good long while to do that, doesn't mean that I have to lean on my horn. One fellow did that, and the person got out of the car and walked back and said, I'll stay here and blow your horn if you'll go get my car started. You know, sometimes we don't know the whole story. A preacher friend of mine told me in one city in which both of us had lived, he said, I was driving one day and I was irritated about something, and, and I came flying down to a stop sign, and there came this long line of cars, and he said, I shut down on my horn just about the time the hearse passed. You know, that, those are times you want to crawl in the concrete. And you think, oh, you ever said that word? Oh, if I had just, you can finish it, can't you? If I'd just known. But you see, if I'm aware of my influence, it makes a big difference. I was sitting in the line at McDonald's. I had free folks send me money. And uh, the person in front of me was taking a pretty long time. And I thought, now, if I had touched the horn, you think maybe that might encourage them. And I thought, no, the world's not moving that fast. I think I'll be patient today. I was so glad I was. I got up to the window, got ready to pay, and the lady said, oh, the person ahead of you paid for yours. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, I'm glad I didn't blow that horn. You exert an influence. And you exert an influence, and I exert an influence wherever we go and with whom we are, whether they know us or not. Whether we're a stranger out of town or, in Brian's case, out of country, people watch us. I read an article not long ago about a person who was coming back into the country and he was explaining to the customs agent that he was a preacher for the Churches of Christ and he had been on a mission trip and the person at customs said, go on through. If you're a member of the church, I don't have to check your baggage. Now wouldn't that be wonderful of all of us? If people learn we're Christians, there are certain things about you that characterize the way you live and what you are that make you different from the people in the world. We all know Matthew 5, 13 to 16. Beautiful passage. If you've been with me for a while, you've underlined it, underscored it, circled it. It probably has a thumbprint by it. 
Because I really believe the Sermon on the Mount is the background to, the, to understanding the New Testament. And Jesus said, you are the light of the world. We sing it at VBS, don't we? And I'm still convinced we need to sing it in our assemblies. It's not a song that's too little for, for men and women. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a light, and, a light and put it under the bushel. We say no. I encourage the boys and girls and the men and women to say no loudly and then take it out the door with us to really mean it. You don't hide it under a bushel, but you put it on the lampstand and it shines to all who are in the house. Even so, here's application now. Let your individuality let your light so shine before men that they may, S-E-E, -E, if you mark that word, see, circle it. They may see. That's demonstration. One poet said, I may learn soon how to do it if you let me see it done. In presentation, we call that demonstration. You say what you're saying, then you demonstrate it. And some of you are visual learners. And so if people show you what they're talking about, what they're talking, then you're able to grasp it and see it and do it. But if they just talk about it. In my 10th grade geometry class, my, my teacher knew geometry. In fact, I think she and Pythagoras may have gone to school together. She knew geometry. And she could see planes out in the nether, nether land. I was looking for an airport. I had no idea about what she was speaking. And I never did get it. And that's the way Christianity is to some people. We say Christianity, that's a big word. But if they can see it done. If they can see it done in our lives. Let your light so shine before men that they may see, look at it, your good works and glorify your Father. Look at the personal pronouns there. Your good works are to bring glory to your Father and that talks about a family relationship. God is our Heavenly Father. Jesus is our older brother, Romans 8, and we're all younger brothers and sisters in the household, Galatians 6.10, of God, the church. It's the house of God, 1 Timothy 3 and 15, Isaiah 2, 2. So we're letting it be seen. And really, if you take Matthew 5, 13 to 16 and reverse the order, you have how to do evangelism. Let your light so shine before the world that the world may see. I can't go into all the world. Even with the internet, Brian told us this morning about places that don't get the internet. So individually, I can't go to every place in the world. But then you back up a, a step. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. The world's made up of cities. I live in a city, so I can take Christianity to the city. Yes, I'm the light of the world, but I live in a city, and the world's made up of cities. So when Christians in cities take Christianity to the cities, we will get it to the world. But I have not yet been able to get to everyone in this city. Men don't light a lamp and put it under a bushel but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all that are in the house. I live in a household. Cities are made up of households. So if I take it home, I start. And if we take it next door and next door and they take it next door and next door, then we've done it. But it doesn't start at home. Let your light. It's individual. Until I light the light and let it be seen, I won't take it home with me. See, Joseph took his religion home with him. And when you take Christianity home with you, then you help others in the home shine their lights. And then the homes go to the cities and the cities to the world. Now he gave the negative side of that. He said if salt has lost its savor, 
it's not good for anything but to throw it on the roads, and that's what Rome did. With unsalty salt, they used it to pack the roads down, and people walked on it. So you want to be useful. The unstable man, the double-minded man of James chapter 1, one modern translation says he's useless. And that's true. He's here today, here tomorrow. No one knows where he is or what he believes or for what he stands. The old saying used to go around, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Could you call witnesses in, testify, yes, that person's a Christian. In some communities years ago, they could not find a Bible in order to swear a witness in at a trial. And the judge looked out and said, there, and called this man's name and said, he's a member of the Church of Christ and they know the Bible. Come up here, put your hand on his head. Could I stand in? We used to be known as walking Bibles. If you remember the church, people in the community knew. People want a Bible question answered, ask them. They study their Bible. They know their Bible. They live their Bible. In fact, in years past, in most congregations, the people in the pew knew as much or more about the Bible than the preacher did. And they knew when truth was being preached and when it was accurate. Is that true of us? Is that our Christianity? Is that our influence on other people? Probably all of you have had people walk up to you and say, I've been watching you, and, and they fill in the blank. I've told you about taping radio programs. You're sitting looking out a window or looking at a wall. And you wonder, does this go any further? And then you're moving out of a house and you've gone back to close it up and clean it up and the phone rings and someone says, I've been playing your tapes and I want to be baptized. You just wonder. And when we look into this camera, and Don keeps telling me you need to look at the camera more. When we look into this camera and we're broadcasting out you, you wonder sometimes, does it get outside the building? And then, as I'll tell you a little later, you hear about people obeying the gospel. Because you folks who know what you're doing, instead of messing up the picture like I did after class, get this out. You help us preach the gospel. Like when we send people like Brian. It's not Brian's work, it's our work. He's doing his part. We're doing our part. And aren't you so glad after that report in Bible class this morning that we support this work? You need to tell our elders that. We're glad we support this work. We're glad our contribution is going to taking the gospel to Guyana. And all those people you mentioned are friends of mine, and I appreciate their work. And I appreciate yours. That's our influence. And I'm sure Brian's aware of this. I'm aware of it. Every time you go in now the country, those folks in the airport watch you. Sometimes for different reasons, but they watch you. And they pay attention to what people do. Law enforcement people are probably, among teachers, the most underappreciated people in society. Do you ever just walk up to an officer of the law and say, thank you for working, thank you for keeping us safe? Or soldier, thank you for serving so I can be free? Thank you. When I was in Trinidad, we went to the park on our day off and I was told the president was out on the other side of the park. Now, my mama was a woman, so I'm curious. And so I started walking that way. I just wanted to get a glimpse. And I noticed this soldier was kind of paralleling me. And I went to a certain place and started that way, and he slapped his rifle. Now, I don't speak rifle, but I got that one. 
He was protecting that man that I couldn't even see out there. I could see his vehicle. And he intended to protect him. And I intended to let him. I understood. But see, they were watching me. And one, I was a foreigner. Well, they're watching you. People are watching you. We sing a song, don't we? There's an all-seeing eye watching you. You can go into what was the Katoma Street Church building in Montgomery, Alabama, which at one time was a Jewish synagogue, and up on the walls an eye. And nowhere, no matter where you go in that building, that eye looks like it's looking right at you. It's an all-seeing eye watching you. But they're all-seeing eyes watching us. They want to know what we're doing. In Proverbs 11 and verse 30, Solomon made an interesting statement. He who wins souls is wise. Literally, he who takes in souls is wise. We used to sing a song. I don't hear it much anymore. I want to be a soul winner for Jesus. A soul winner every day. Or lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what to say. Friends of mine are lost in sin and do not know the way. Lead me to some soul today. He who wins souls is wise. Do you know how you win souls? Sometimes people say, well, I want to be a soul winner. Let's have a class. That's not the way you do it. If you approach it that way, here's the way it goes. Here's the way it's gone for my whole career. Let's have a class. We have a class. Probably 13 weeks. Oh boy, we had a class on how to win souls. That's it. How many souls are you winning? None. We had a class. If you don't get out and do it. So a class may help. That's a tool. But it's not going to get it done. You know what's going to get it done? This is very simple. Don't make it harder than it is. When you walk out of the baptistry, you need to realize I'm a soul winner. That's what Jesus expects me to be. That's my responsibility. I've had people tell me, I'm not on the visitation team. And I sometimes will ask you, you mean you haven't been baptized? Uh, well, yeah, I've been baptized. Brother, if you've been baptized, you're on the visitation team. God put you on it. It's not a sign up. It's not a volunteer. It's not do it if you like it. If you're a Christian, you're a soul winner. And that doesn't mean you are responsible for baptizing anyone. That's not our job. It means we are responsible for giving people an opportunity to obey the gospel. And we can do that in a number of ways. I'm not responsible for someone being baptized. That would put power in me. Romans 1.16 says the power is in the gospel. My responsibility is to get the gospel to people. Make opportunities available for them to hear and obey the gospel. In Daniel chapter 12, verse, <clears throat> verses 1 to 3, in talking about some things that are going to come in times that are removed from Daniel's time, in fact, beginning in Daniel 11, he starts talking about the coming of the Medo-Persian Empire and how there's going to be war between the Ptolemies in Egypt and the Seleucids up in the northern part of the country. He talks about those battles, Palestine to be right in the middle. And in Daniel 12, 1 and 2, he said, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Look at that. Now when you get to the book of Revelation, you're going to talk about those who were written in the book whose names are in the book of life. In Philippians 4, 1, Paul talked about those whose names are written in the book of life. Those whose, who was, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life. That's your faithful Christian. Some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now notice this. 
Those who are wise <clears throat> shall shine. Well, we've learned from Solomon, those who are wise win souls. They use their influence. And then he uses a simile, like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever, turning many to righteousness. James, in James 5, 19 and 20, said, if you convert a sinner, now that's an unfaithful Christian there, from the error of his way, you've saved a soul from death and covered a multitude of sins. How many of our unfaithful members are you reaching out to recover? And I know it's hard, since we don't all assemble in the same place, to know who's not even coming at all. And who's fallen away and who is unfaithful. So we have to double our efforts to just reach out to the whole congregation to encourage us. Come to the building. If you don't come in, come to the parking lot. Let's all come together, at least to this place. Let's show our love and our interest and build up the congregation. And I know there's some physical who can't do that, and I'm so thankful we're out there on social media to allow that, but that becomes a crutch sometimes, and it's just so easy to watch it on television, a lot more easier than it is to put forth the effort to come together. I understand that. I know concentration's better sometimes that way. I understand all those arguments. But you know the Lord intended his people to come together. And so we exert our influence when we're together. We exert our influence on one another. You encourage me to keep on by your keeping on. I've seen people attend the services that I would look at them and I would go to the mirror sometimes and I'd say, now what's your excuse? You talk about people walking? Sometimes people can't walk and they carry them. And people make effort to get people here. Some of you remember, well, a few of you remember, back when you had a van and you had crippled people who were brought and there were folks who had to help them get in and out. And people said, that's important. We want to get those people there. Four people brought a lame man to Jesus who walked out on his own. He'd have been lame apparently the rest of his life, as far as we know, had they not said, we're willing to exert the effort. Aren't we blessed with wonderful automobiles in which we could bring someone? That we could encourage someone? If you don't have one of these, we'll get you help. Because I don't know anybody in the United States now hardly that doesn't have one of these. Now you may not have a landline. Some of you don't know what that is. But we have communication right now, and we're blessed to be able to talk to one another. Can't pick up a phone in Guyana. And we're blessed. Are we using it to use our influence, to exert our influence, to say to someone, I was just thinking about you today and haven't seen you in a long time. I want to encourage you to be back at services. Young people need to be doing that. If you're old enough to obey the gospel, you're old enough to work to exert your influence, to be what you ought to be. And young people influence old folks sometimes. We talk about the old folks setting good examples, but the young people influence old folks sometimes. And they make us energetic. Don't you like to be around the energetic people, those of you who are my age and those of you who are even older than I am? Don't you like to be around people who give you some energy? You can feed off of their energy? They pep you up, build you up by their enthusiasm, their encouragement. That's Christianity. That's Christian influence. It's hard to smile behind a mask, isn't it? But I think I've noticed a lot of people know when you're smiling at them, even behind a mask. Your eyes somehow radiate that. 
and I've seen people brighten up. I don't know if they were brightening up because I like Brian and look better behind the mask or if they were brightening up because they saw me smiling at them. Who knows? Yeah, that's better. Who knows? But I believe our eyes exude. You know, I, I'm speaking to you. And that's the way we speak a lot of times, isn't it? When we could see one another, we smile and said hello. Or we nod. Some of you may be past the nodding generation, but my generation nodded at one another, and that was a way of speaking. Some of you have seen the old westerns. They, the men would touch the brim of their hats, and they were showing deference to a lady. All kinds of ways of exerting influence. You, are you with me? It's not special. It's not a particular thing that you have to have that no one else has. It's just being what you are. That's what Christianity is. It's being what you became when you obeyed the plan of salvation. And it's being it all the time. And when we sin, and Christians do, we influence people sometimes when we correct that sin. Think about the people Brother Simon must have influenced in Samaria when he repented of trying to buy the miraculous. Acts 8, 22 to 24. Think about those people in Ephesus who were influenced when those people who had become Christians realized we can't keep our magic books. We can't keep these magic formulae that we have had. People know we have that. They know we practice that. And so in Acts 19, you read about a bonfire in Ephesus. Think about what an influence that had to have on that, on that city. Here are Christians who are learning better than some of the things they've been doing. And as Christians, they're correcting them as they learn better. And they're bringing these books. And the continuous tense of the original there indicates they kept on throwing them on the pile. So when I sin, it's not the end of the world if I'll correct it. Correct it with the people involved. I sinned against you. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I tell our boys and girls when we study about marriage, one contraction and one word may keep your marriage alive. I'm sorry. Mates need to learn to say that to one another. Sometimes we get stubborn and we're too good to apologize. I'm sorry. And Christians sometimes have to say that to people. I messed up. What I did was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Help me do better. And it may be today you're ready to be a Christian. We want to help you do that. In the very beginning of our study, we talked about the plan of salvation. Faith in Jesus. Repentance of sins. A confession of faith and a burial in baptism unto the remission of sins. And a resurrection then to walk a new lifestyle. It may be you're ready today to correct unfaithfulness in your life. It may be individual to be corrected with only you and God. It may be local that can be corrected with you and others. It may be so prominent you need to correct it and have your brethren help you do so. Whatever the case. This middle pew is open if you need to respond in a public way today and we can be of assistance to you. If you're coming to us via some other means and you are in need of Bible study or response, if you'll contact us, we'll be about the business of trying to help you. That's what we want to do. Because somewhere in life, if I serve God, I have to make a resolution. We talk a lot about that about New Year's, don't we? making resolutions. But if we're going to serve God, we have to make them and keep them. I can see a man in the pig pen who said, I'm resolved no longer to linger. I'm going home where daddy's servants have leftovers. I'm starving. I'm resolved to make a change. Are you resolved while we stand and encourage?
sin and strife. He is the true one. He is the just one. He hath the words of life. I will hasten to him. Hasten so Another part of worship is we are to give us that we've been prospered. Let us give thanks for that opportunity. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the material blessings you've, you've bestowed upon us. As we give back, help us do so with a cheerful heart in a way that's well-pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been blessed by being together today, and we've been blessed by having you with us. Our next service will be tonight at 6. We invite you to be with us at that time. <laughs> 